بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونواله وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we are now talking about rulings of the غسل washing the deceased we went through the process of washing someone who is deceased and now we'll be talking about a few مسائل issues surrounding that the first one is regarding um, spouses may they are they allowed to wash each other if one passes away What's the ruling of the marriage after someone passes away, etc. So we've got Hassan with us. Assalamu alaikum, Hassan. Wa alaikum salam, Sheikh. Hope you're well. Alhamdulillah. Good, good. So bismillah, over to you. Please read. Um, okay, so the, the wife is permitted to wash her deceased husband, though the opposite is not permitted. Yes. Uh, likewise, a slave who has given birth to a child of a master cannot perform the wash, washing of her master. Yeah, so these are masail between men and women. And can the man wash the woman? Can the woman wash the man? First of all, the lady may wash her deceased husband because when a male, when the husband dies, the lady goes into the idda period, the waiting period commonly known as. Uh, and that for a widow is four months and 10 days. And since there are rules of nikah still valid, as in they still have certain rules of nikah that you know she's not marriageable to anybody else, um, she gets inheritance from him and so forth. Uh, then she is allowed to do the ghusl. It's not going to be common that she actually does it. Okay, just the ruling, the men will take care of the ghusl. But in case there was ever a situation that she needed to come forward or she was, you know, the one to wash him, she may do so. Um, but it's like, a, like I said, it's not really going to be something that happens very often or at all, really. The other way around, however, if the wife dies, okay, and the husband has not got the option basically or is allowed to wash his deceased wife because when she passes away there is a complete break in the marriage nothing remains of that nikah no remnants no rulings it's just finished with the proof that he can marry four ladies and he's not just have to worry about his deceased wife he can marry her sister even if that's something that happens but the, the point of that is saying that the rules of nikah with her are fully fully finished uh, which actually complicates things because people say she's not his wife, can you look at her and all that. Yes, technically speaking, she's not his wife, can't really look at her, etc., without her covering on, etc. You know, the normal rules of looking at the opposite gender then apply. So that's important to understand uh, that the marriage bond is broken, the rules of marriage are finished. There's no waiting period for a husband to wait, etc., until he can marry again. He can marry again the next minute, the next day, um, even for wives, like I said, he can marry anyway. No, second wife, but if he was did have three wives, he could marry a fourth one, no problem. Um, and the final one is in the olden days, there was uh, the mother of this child, the mother of this given birth to a child. That you know, sometimes the uh, a person have a concubine, as they call them, or you know, a lady that would bear children for him. Now, he wouldn't be married to her, but he, so she's like a she's not a wife, but she's like a you know, um. Uh, she has the right to feed him. She's father of. She's the mother of his children or a child, and uh, he dies now. Can she marry? Can she wash her deceased, like uh, previous, uh, you know, owner, whatever you want to call it, right? Um, that fact that she's the mother of his children and she has a child from him, and that's you know his lineage, etc. The answer is no. Um, again, that would never happen as well, right? First of all, that's never going to happen now, anyway. Even in the past, there was no need for that. The men would take care of the janaza. Always discussing here is the ruling of it. So people get all worked up in these rulings. Let's be practical. These are never going to apply from our lifetimes in our situation. So we need to worry about them too much. Yes, they are rulings. Um, and if they do happen, then the following is actually most likely to happen. So if you read on, this is the most likely thing to happen, not the above, right? But yes, bismillah. Uh, if a female dies amongst men, they are to purify her by tayammum. Likewise, if a man dies amongst women, they are to purify him by tayammum. If, however, there is a relative present who is unmarriageable, mahram, then they are permitted to give the deceased tayammum without a cloth. Yeah. So, and the final part? Uh, the same applies for a hermaphrodite. Uh, that is, that they are to be purified by tayammum according to the most evident opinion. Yeah, so the situation is male passes away. There's no men there to do the whistle. So ladies have to get involved. Yes, they will have to get involved. 
Um, there is no, if a woman dies, there is no women through the ghusl, so a male will have to get involved. Now, in that previous situation, the wife could do a ghusl itself, right? So that's the only time the ghusl will really apply to a lady for a man. Uh, the deceased husband can be washed by his wife, right? So that could come into it. However, if there's no one around, no family around, no, no, you know, may, no males around, uh, his family and family, it could be any stranger, male, can any, wash any other male Muslim, right? Um, so who's going to wash this man? Nobody. There's no men around. Nobody washes him. The lady, family, preferably, of course, uh, someone close, sister, mother, daughter even, would come and do a tayammam. They use a cloth, so they don't put skin-to-skin contact. A cloth is used, khirqa, and tayammam is performed to represent the ghusl. Um, so tayammam of the whole body actually would be taken into regard here. Um, but it does say if there is a very close family member, like which means uh, basically somebody who's a relative of yours and you can't marry them. So sometimes relatives, you can marry their cousins and so forth. They're rahim, they're your kinship. But mahram means somebody you can't marry. And again, might not be actually related to you, like a milk brother or milk sister. But in this case, it has to be both. You're not allowed to marry them and they're related to you, which is siblings, uh, which is mother, da- daughter, or if it was a fem- female that was deceased, grandfather, grandchild even. These are people that are your mahram, you can't marry them, and they're part of your lineage, your kinship, your relations. If that person is there, then the cloth doesn't need to be used. They can do the uh, with their hands. Um, because they allowed to touch them generally in, in life as well, of course, not everything. Uh, so there shouldn't be any looking when doing this, by the way, uh, especially on the, the certain areas. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, the final one there is, if there is this hermaphrodite, which is basically a person, we're not sure if it's a male or a female due to bodily features and genetics and what's happened to them. It's, it's very rare and probably, again, something we'll never come across in our lifetimes. We're not sure if it's a male for the men to do the ghusl or if it's a female for the ladies to do the ghusl. What happens? Someone does a tayammam as well. So the person, they do they do the wiping and there's no ghusl for such a person if they they have that, that situation. Khuntha uh, al-Mushkil in Arabic. Um, yeah, but very rare. We don't need to mention it too much. Let's move on to some other situations. The um, fadl. It is permitted for a man to wash a young girl, uh, provided he does not desire her. Like were, Likewise, it is permitted for a woman to wash a young boy, provided she does not desire him. Yeah, so what we're saying here is that um, what about young boys and girls, right? Can the opposite gender wash them? Generally, no, again. If a boy passes away, the men will wash the boy. If a girl passes away, the ghusl is done by the ladies. Okay, what if there is no one around? What if the mother wants to get involved with a small child? Yes, they can. No problem. Uh, as long as they're not in an age where they become developed, let's say, and change, and, uh, you know, early teens, maybe even younger, who knows? People develop at different ages, right? So just that. So if, but if you know, the puberty is set in, features are developing, then in that case, the opposite gender shouldn't get involved, even though it might be a child, like in age-wise, uh, but they developed a bit, and there might be some problem in that, right? So the, the, basically, Islam is there to make sure nothing happens that's not good or unbe- unbe- not befitting, or uh, it, you know, it looks after the honour and rights of everyone. Um, so yeah, so in that case, you know, uh, an older girl, or older boy would pro- pro- preferably and most likely be washed by the same gender, for younger ones, it's allowed the Jews and it's allowed for the uh, opposite gender to um, uh, to do the ghusl, right? Because the, the the young children, right? Allah um, Alam. There is no harm if one kisses the deceased. Yeah. So can we touch the deceased? Can you kiss the deceased? What was is that allowed? That kind of stuff. Um, obviously, there's no need to do anything unnecessary, right? They just hold the hand of the deceased for a long time, anything like that. But um, the Prophet son did kiss some of the deceased of his family, of his you know close uh, members of his family, etc. Sin Abu Bakr did kiss the Prophet Ali Salam, and he left this world, uh, and he was you know on his transition to the Barzakh Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So yeah, if that's somebody, obviously you're allowed to kiss, and your family member or somebody dear to you that is a friend. Uh, usually they kiss on the forehead if that's what you do. Uh, that's allowed. We know that that's, that was done uh, in the time of the Prophet. It's not something that came after or anything. But it's not common either. So, you know, 
it only be done by close family members, etc. So yeah, if that is the case, no problem. Labas, further. It is the responsibility of the man in preparing his deceased wife, even if he is in financial difficulty, um, and this is the correct view. Yeah, so uh, again, this goes back to the rules of um, maintenance and expenditure of a family. Uh, when alive, it's the hukam of Allah, Allah's command that we, uh, or the husbands, the spouses, they provide the accommodation, they provide the clothing and food, uh, and that's a right that you know, the, 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 the wives have over their husbands uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when a lady passes away, she has a husband who's, you know, like we said, their nikah is broken. But now, in terms of her final shrouding, final clothing, is that not on, on him anymore? Like we said, the nikah is broken. Does he have to give the money for the to pro provide that final uh, shrouding, basically, right? As part of the whole husband and wife procedure. Um, although that is, it says that in most correct opinion, there was discussions like what if he hasn't got the wealth? What, because even in life, if you haven't got money, you're still responsible to provide for your family and you've got to work hard or get money from somewhere, etc. Uh, so what if he hasn't got enough? Is, is he still required? So scholars differ over that one. Um, and, you know, practically speaking, in terms of, um, you know, people coming forward and people giving, any family member can pay for that. Her father might do it, her son might do it. Husband might say, oh, it's my duty. But he has the right. That's the important thing, actually. He has the right. Nobody else can take that away from him. So if he actually says, look, it's my right to provide, I'm going to do it. Nobody can say, oh, wait a minute, you know, she's our daughter. She, he has that right as well. It works two ways. One, it's a responsibility, but it's a right as well, which is, means that I want the rewards. I want to, you know, this, do this final thing for my spouse, etc. Of course, you know, most people would think of it like that. Alhamdulillah. Uh, it's not like a burden on you, that, you know, etc. So, um, so yeah, so that's, um, you know, um, that's how it is. That, that hopefully that makes sense, right? So if the lady passes away, uh, she has a husband when she passed away, who's responsible for shrouding her? He is, right? Providing the shroud, etc., to the ladies to shroud her. Um, if she has no spouse, then it'll be just her family members, father, etc. Normally the first son, if she has a son, even though she hasn't got a spouse, the son is the most responsible person for the uh, parents before their own parents. So in terms of who has the most rights and responsibilities is the children. Obviously, adult children. So, if somebody was at age of fifty and passed away, and they've got a father who's seventy and a, a son who's thirty, right? Who has the most rights and who's the most responsible for the father or for that the deceased individual, the father or the son, the son? So, who has the most rights? The janaza, the son. Who has to shroud the the deceased, the son? So, the son is actually we always say the father is the first who has rights over everyone. No, it's, it's actually like the son, but because the son's usually a child, right? Um, doesn't come into the equation, but in that situation, yes, it's the the responsibility falls on the on the son, right? So, that in, and if you look at the closest relatives to a person, it's actually the son, okay? Uh, Allah alam, there's probably a lot of wisdom in that because children are, you know, uh, the way they see their parents is different to the way the parents see the children. Um, and if you've been through both, like you know, if you've got children, you'd understand that. If you don't, then obviously you need to have children and you figure that out. Um, but I don't know exactly what wisdom it is in that, but the, the son is the, uh, the the closest to Wali. And I say your Wali is your father. Your, the son is the closest Wali. Uh, so hence he can give his mother's hand away in marriage. Obviously not to his own father, they'd already be married, but uh, they'll be divorced or something, right? Uh, to his second husband. It's the son that has that right to be the Wali, etc. Um Interesting one, another topic, but yeah, uh, back to this point. Um, the husband will prepare the shrouding for his deceased wife. Uh, whoever dies and has no money, then the cost of the shrouding is to be paid by those who are legally required to assist him before he died. Such as yeah, so family. yeah, so normally you pass away, you think something happens to you. We are responsible for you know our own clothing during life, right? So when you leave the world, you've got money. They most of us leave something behind. Before it's distributed amongst your heirs and inheritors, then you have to prepare your burial. You know, you need to buy a plot, you need to pay for procedures. All that comes from the deceased individual's wealth. Um, nobody else has to pay if he has wealth. Okay, so what if he doesn't, he's going to mention next. Um, so, yeah, whoever, who, uh, you know, your wealth is used. Now, if you don't have any wealth, who pays for it? Whoever would have paid for your maintenance had you been alive. So, you know, like you said, mother and father, who's going to pay for their maintenance? The children, 
right? So if mom and dad are old, they don't have income, who's looking after them? The children have to look after them. So when it comes to the kafan and et cetera, all the, all the costs involved, the children need to get together and put the money. I mean, it doesn't have to be that they pay equally. They should pay equally if there's going to be this argument. If one of them says, look, I'll take care of it all, that's fine. Uh, again, they all have a right to, to give a, a share, et cetera. Uh, but the responsibility falls on the whoever was responsible for their expenditure during their lifetime. So it's, it's part of the expenditure into the barzakh, right? It's part of the final, like you said, for the husband to the wife. Similarly, if, if a person hasn't got his own own wealth, enough I, to pay for a, um, their kafan and the burial, etc., then that will be on uh, the closest family members. Um, and if not, it says, where will it be? If there is no such person present, then the responsibility falls upon Bayt al -Mar. Carry on. Uh, if, however, there are no funds given for the sharing of the deceased from Bayt al -Mar, either due to insufficient funds or injustice, then it is upon the people. Yeah, so, so next, okay, family haven't got nothing. Poor, poor family, could have happened. Uh, who's next? Where do we go? The Bayt al Mal is a tragedy, is the, is, the, is the finances of the government, the, Islam, the Muslim country. It's their duty. They have wealth, they have whatever they collect from taxes, from payments. Uh, we need to shroud somebody. No zakat can be used for shrouding of a person. That question is going to be asked. Why? You're not giving ownership to someone. You have to be alive to have ownership of something. Technically, you can get stuff, but we won't go to a technical stuff, really rare situations. So you can't be given zakat. You can be given one as sadaqah and as charity, but you can't be given one as zakat. When you speak, it's a zakat masala. Zakat can't be used for a shroud of a deceased person. Any of this form of sadaqah can be non-wajib sadaqah, can be like nafal sadaqah, just general sadaqah, let's call it. Um, so yeah, Bayt al-Mal will provide. Okay, fantastic. Okay, well, if they don't provide, they're not giving, they're not listening, you can't get to the authorities, can't wait around for six months to get you know this money. Um, you could probably claim it back later, maybe. I don't know, but who... Who does it then? Then you have to do it as a community. It's a part of the kifaya, okay? The ghusl was a part of the kifaya. The takfeen becomes a part of the kifaya at this stage. At this stage, meaning the person hasn't got no money, family hasn't got no money, authorities are not providing anything. Now it's the community's duty to come together and provide this. Obviously, those who are able to, and everyone has to give like share, somebody's poor, then leave them alone, go to those who have the ability. And uh, who goes around doing that? Who, who, who collects all this money? Fadal? A person who is financially unable to assist the deceased in the shrouding or burial is required to seek assistance from others on behalf of the deceased. Yeah. So basically, family members would be the primary ones, right? They're not able to do it themselves. They're family members. They're going to go and ask others, could you please give some money for this person's shrouding and burial? Uh, you know, not getting money to do so. And it doesn't have to be 100 times. Ask a few people, get the money and so forth. But yeah, those who are family and responsible but don't have the ability to actually do the shrouding, etc., they would then go to those who are able and ask on his behalf, right? He means he's, he's passed away, he can't ask on his own behalf, right? Uh, but it's, in, during life, nobody has to ask for anybody else, right? If somebody hasn't got something, they can ask for themselves. So you don't ask, have to ask for, have to ask. In this case, you have to. It's, it's like the Fard Kifai on the community. People need to be made aware of this. People need to be asked for money, basically, right? Who's going to do that? Those people responsible will have to go and ask. It's not begging. It's just obviously a way of, you know, um, fulfilling the right of a deceased. That's how we see it, right? Otherwise, what we're going to do? Bury him without a shroud? Not, not bury him at all? What we're going to do? So we need to go around and quickly ask those who are able to uh, you know, assist, please can you give? And it usually happens, you know, today, I mean, modern day, just giving page will do the trick. Uh, you know, your contacts, you know, few text messages. Uh, enough for you to go around and speak to people and you can do that as well. Um, and it's a rare situation that occurs. But yeah, sometimes somebody in the community may not be, uh, have any family members, they may come to the country, they may be based in Islam. And they pass away, yeah, there's not going to be maybe anyone to be there for them. So the community has to, the local masjid. In that situation, there's usually a setup where it's all done nice and quietly and you know uh, honorably etc but sometimes they do say you know a masala comes up in an area where there's no muslims maybe or no muslims or a, a muslim is made aware an employee of the hospital or someone so he then contacts someone and says look we need to do this that so sometimes it becomes a bit more public uh, but really in this situation the better the more it's kept private and confidential the better right and you know ask people privately confidentially is better but you know it's need to be and to get the funds 
uh, is made public somewhat, then that's you know not uh, any disrespect or uh, anything negative about that. Okay, so that concludes all the masail on the ghusl. So we talked about the ghusl last time, and we just added a few more, as you can see, issues regarding the ghusl and the who, who pays for the shrouding. Remember the shrouding, yeah, we just talked about who has to give the shrouding. That leads us nicely into the next section of shrouding the deceased, okay? Uh, to enshroud the deceased is obligatory. Uh, the sunnah shrouding of a man consists of um, a, a shirt, uh, be a wrapper, izar, and uh, see an outer wrapper, uh, lifafa. Yeah. And the quality of the shrouds is to be equal to the clothing one would wear when he was alive. Alive, right. So, takfin, so there's two words here, kafan and takfin. Kafan is the shroud. Takfin is the shrouding. Takfin is for the fire, just like the seal, ghusl is for the fire. You, the deceased can't shroud himself. Shrouding, the act of putting on the shrouds, is somebody's got to do it. That's a far of It's an obligation that somebody has to take up, and usually a family member does. Whereas, actually, actually the kufan itself, which you just talked about, is from the wealth of the person himself, okay? Um, that wealth is taken, or some of it, and a, and a kufan is purchased, and explains there what quality should be purchased. The quality of clothing you wore in your lifetime, whatever this is made of right now, whatever we're wearing, whatever you're wearing right now, the quality in the sense of the pricing that you normally would buy, stuff, you know, you don't go and buy, people, don't, people I don't know, some of you may do, but nobody goes buy a thousand pound pair of jeans. We always buy like 50 pound pair, 60 pound, 20 pound, 100 pound, if you're going for a big, nice one. Or, that's average. So yeah, in for the coffin of a deceased, don't get the cloth that's 100 pound a meter. You're going to probably get one that's 5, 10, 20 pound a meter. That's quality. That's good. You want to honor the deceased. So the average kind of expenditure that you expect is what should be taken from the wealth of the deceased and then that purchased with okay that, that used to purchase the coffin uh because one there's a few things to remember here one if the person has wealth then after everything is done that's to be distributed amongst the heirs there's maybe a will to execute and carry out so you can't just take all the money for him or her not all of it's going to be taken these things by the way but several thousand a few maybe a few thousand more could be spent unnecessarily in some cases that uh, you're taking away from the rights of others and there's no like spiritual benefit in the deceased taking that you know, like we mentioned last time the, the burial isn't a, a procession where you decorate things and you know make look, things look nice it's just a case of honoring the person with the rights of the, these rights of Islam and so forth and then praying for them that's the really important thing about this um, that's important and, and secondly if the well if it comes from somebody else's wealth because the deceased is leaving him behind they're not required to go and buy the most expensive or the in etc. It's their choice what they do. Shouldn't go the cheapest either. You should get you should think that oh, this person would wear these types of clothes. Let's shroud him in a similar quality of cloth. Okay. That, that's basically what it's saying. And what is it that you got to get or what is it that is the is the coffin itself? Uh for the men, so there's two sections here. One is the coffin for the men and second is the coffin for the um uh, women, the, the the ladies. Okay. So we're going to look at well, first of all, for the men, it's mentioned it's three items or three three cloths. So the coffin is literally three pieces of cloth for men and three pieces of five pieces of cloth for women. Okay, that, that's literally what it is. Okay, uh, each of these pieces of cloth are different sizes um, and are used for different methods or parts of the body, etc. Uh, and we're going to be discussing that um, next, inshallah. Ta'ala. But before we discuss that, what if you can't afford or what if you can't get all these three pieces for a man and all five? For a woman, it's going to mention a few options, but really just do your best basically. Add in what you can, take away what you can't get, figure out what's best in terms of wrapping up the deceased, you know, the showering the deceased and, and burying them. That's really what you got to do. So it's going to mention a few masail of, um, of that. So it says, well, keep what keep fire. The sufficient shrouding is in the inner wrapper uh, and the outer wrapper. White cotton is the best and preferred type of shroud. Yeah, so there you go. So if you don't have the ability to have all three pieces for a male, it says the kifaya, like, you know, what uh, what we can best do is take the izar and the lifafa. They're the two biggest cloths. So the izar, we'll go through these in a second uh, when it describes how to do the kafan. But there's, there's usually two big pieces of cloth for a male and one which is called the kamis, the shirt, which is a bit shorter. You just take away the shortest one and get the two biggest ones that cover the whole body, basically. Um, and sorry, the next point you mentioned, uh, the length of both the inner wrapper and the outer wrapper are to be from the head of the deceased to the feet. 
Yes, um, so this is now describing these uh, various uh, parts of the uh, the coffin, okay, um, and how they all work. Can you see that, Hassan? Yeah, yeah, I've got it. Okay, brilliant. So it's a shrouding procedure, men. Okay, I'm just gonna go through it and then we can read it back. So you're gonna pull out three cloths, right? So these are three strips of cloth which are like for, like strings to tie up things, right? You'll see why in a second. There's a big piece of cloth. This isn't to scale or anything, right? It's just randomly made on PowerPoint, as you can see. Um, so this is the outer shroud. So basically a big piece of cloth. It probably would have been a bit wider, to be honest, right? So it can wrap around the person. But yeah, it's like that. And then you have an inner shroud, which is called the izar. These are the two biggest pieces of cloth. And this is for a man, so we're talking about the men first. And we'll do this again for women. We'll show you how it works for the lady. And then you have this qamis. As you can see, the qamis, is like a, not the same kameez as a normal living kameez, but it's similar, similar somewhat to that. I would personally make it a bit bigger than this. Maybe I should have changed it a little bit. The kameez would probably come down further, more towards the feet rather than just up there. And this is called the kameez, and it says, is the length of the shoulder to shin twice, meaning it's got a back to it as well. So it's not just on the top. It's got a back to this kameez and a front, and you're literally placed inside that. There's an opening for the head for you to be placed in there. Okay, It's not really a 3D diagram, but... This is, and again, random dummy picture of the internet. Um, this is how you'd be placed in. Like I said, you probably would be a bit longer and this would probably go further down to more your ankles. So it's not about where it goes up to. And then the rest of this would be um, folded over as we're gonna describe. Uh, so the women procedure is next. But we'll, we'll go through this now um, with Hassan. So Bismillah, if you wanna mention that again. So the Izar and the Lifafa are from the head to the toe. But the lifafa is slightly longer, okay? So when you put the body in, let's actually show you that, the full thing. Look, you put the body in, the izar, which is, uh, sorry, the lifafa, which is the outer, the biggest one, it goes above the head, below the feet. The next mm -hmm. one, the izar, which is the inner shroud, but still the second biggest, goes above the head and just to the feet. You could, again, you could put it just below the feet as well, right? So that is not 200% scale, but yeah. So these are the two biggest pieces of cloth, and that's how they would be. Then what does it say? Uh, the shirt is to have no sleeves or opening at the bottom and no pockets. Yeah, so no sleeves, meaning there's no sleeves here. There's no arms for this. And there's no there's no opening at the bottom, meaning that's it's, it's open from all the sides. That's open there. That's open there. That's open there. The only place where it's not torn or cut is among the along the shoulders. So on, along this side here, um, uh, so let's, let's bit, do a bit of drawing, right? Um, along... This side here, there, and that side here. There's no stitching on this, right? It's just not torn there. It's just not cut there. From this side here, all the way down there, and all the way down there, and here, this bottom one. Again, it's not necessarily torn. It's just open. It's completely open, right? So literally, and there's double, like you said, there's one uh, section behind, a section on top, and there's a head, basically, right? So if you actually look at the cloth and open it up fully, Hope, hope people can follow this, right? If you actually take this cloth fully and open it up, it looks like this. So let me just get this. So if you open this cloth up fully, right? Take it out here, right? It'd be like this. A big piece of cloth, twice the length, right? Like that. And there's an opening here for the head. Right, should be in the middle, maybe a bit up. Oops, right about there. Okay. And that's usually not an opening like that. It's usually a slit like that. And the slit can be made vertical as well. So literally what you do is you place the deceased through there and then you fold down this, right? So literally it's a long piece of open cloth. There's no stitching to it. There's no nothing to it. You cut, You have to cut this in. You have to cut out a little, plate, a little slit here to put the head in. Once you put the head in, that head will go there. This will be the rest of the body, right? The legs and et cetera. It will be a bit longer, like you said, so that it goes below the body. Um, arms to the side, etc. Right. This will then go above on top of the person. So we'll get this. Right. So let's let's do that for you. Um, so in this here will disappear. Right. This goes. Why does it go? Because you're folding it down. Right. And it's now covering this person. So we fold it down. It's, it's a white cloth. It covers that person. There. One second. Let's do a proper covering. So you now covered this person over. Yep. And there's that remember there's a slit there. So this is still open from the side. This is still open from the side. This is still open from the bottom. 
Okay, and the legs would be coming out, like I said, it's not to scale diagram. But hopefully that made some sort of sense of how the kamis is. Okay, it's just a piece of cloth, got a little hole in the middle for the head, and you fold it over the disease once you put them into there. So it's, it's a bit of um, effort and, you know, being careful when you do the shrouding. It's not as easy as you just put the disease, this is, put, this is a, a, a motionless person, that several people who get involved and carry and move around. So this, this process might be a diagram here, but practically speaking, when you're on the whistle table, when you get the shrouding, when you do all these, it takes quite a bit of effort and being careful uh, uh, in, in this situation. Um, so yeah, Bismillah, if you want to read on, oh, the, oh, the Messiah, I'm just trying to be practical and give you the practicality. But yeah, if you want to carry on, he's in. Uh, additionally, the edges are not to be hemmed. Yeah. Um, okay, to include a turban with the shrouds is disliked, and this is the yeah. same this for you. Yeah, so the Prophet learned the Sahaba, in general, they didn't really um, have a turban, okay? But some of the scholars, they regard it okay, because um, just one or two of the Sahaba related to have place the turban, maybe uh, on the deceased, etc. But generally, most of the Sahaba never had that done. Um, now they do it for scholars and stuff like that. And in a sign of respecting someone, they, they might do that. But generally speaking, the, the turban was not part of the coffin, right? So it's somewhat disliked. Um, it's further. Uh, the inner wrapper, uh, Izar, is first folded from the left side, then from the right side. Uh, thereafter, the outer wrapper is folded similarly. Yeah, so first of all, first of all let's just take a step back and let's, let's just go back on this one second, right? Let's go back, not forwards. Who's going forwards? Why is that? Uh, men, right, okay. Let's go that way then. Okay, that's backwards. Um, <clears throat> so we play, first of all, it didn't mention it here, but you place out these pieces of thin cloth as ties. They're going to be tied afterwards. Then you place down the, uh, the outer shroud. This is how you lay down the shrouding so you can then place the deceased into the shrouding. The first cloth you're going to place down is the izar. The izar, <clears throat> sorry, uh, sorry, is the lifafa, the biggest one. Then it's the izar, the, the slightly smaller one. Because you, when you fold these, you fold them in reverse order, okay? Um, so the last to be put on is the lifafa because it's the outer one. Therefore, it's the first to be put down, so it's at the, it's at the back. Um, and then you place the kamis, and now you will have it ready. This will actually be open as well. The kamis, like I said, is two feet back and front. And then you bring in the deceased carefully and obviously cover the aura. Love do the whistle, they'll be dried. There'll be some ether put on them, some perfume and stuff we mentioned previously, all of that. Uh, check out the previous video on funeral rites. And then you'll place the deceased very carefully into this kamis, okay? And once the deceased in, remember that they're covered. That's actually covered that area, right? So that's not exposed at all, right? So you won't see anything. And then what do you do? As you read there, um, you fold the left side in first. So the left of this individual is this side here, right? You fold this side of the izar in first, okay? Kamis is the kamis is there, right? So this is now folded over the person, right? It's folded over here, whatever you can get that to there. And then the right-hand side of the izar is folded over the person to the left, okay? So this is left, this is right. Left folded over first, then right fold over second. You might think, why the left first person, right? Why isn't it the right first? Because right is the sunnah. Because the left then stays underneath and the right then be on top. So it's a case of putting the right on top. That's the sunnah here, right? So you put the, before the left first, we put the right on top. And the same procedure for the, the lifafa, the outer one, this one here, right? The lifafa, outer shroud. We, we fold from this first over to that side and took it in. You actually fold around the deceased and took it in. And then you fold this one around and around the deceased. And you might have to lift the deceased to fold it around and stuff, right? Just to make it secure. Once that's done, you'll basically have like that mummy thing, right? You just got a piece of cloth around the person. And remember these, these strings will still be lying underneath the whole coffin. Yeah? Remember these, these, these things here, right? They'll still be lying there. So what do you do? And remember, this is open to be honest, right? This is not anything closed here. This is like open. You tie these around here and here and here to secure the coffin on, because it's just folded cloth at the moment. So you tie these knots or you tie these piece of cloth strings uh, around the top, bottom, 
and middle. You can have more than three, but usually it's about three uh, that's commonly used, okay? So that's the procedure of folding up and wrapping up the deceased in for the male, okay? So yeah, please carry on reading. Uh, the shrouds may be knotted if it is feared they will unfold. Yep, so that's why you have these three string cloths, top, middle, and bottom. Doesn't have to be there, but they may be done if you fear that the movement, the, 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 the coffin might get loose, etc. And it's just caution. Uh, in the sunnah shroud for women, uh, two additional cloths are added to that of the shrouds of a man. The first is a veil uh, to cover her head and face. And the second is a cloth used to cover. So it's a shrouding procedure of women. Again, the same three cloths that we've used, the outer bigger one, lifafa, the outer or the inner one slightly, but still big, bizar, and the qamis, they're still involved. However, we are adding two additional ones. So let's go through them first. So we're adding, first of all, uh, there's a khirqa now, a chest cover for the, for the bosom of the lady. And so the lifafa is still there. There's a khirqa now, which you mentioned. And Izar is still there, so let's bring that in, right? So you can see it there. And then you have now uh, hijab or a, uh, a khimar, it's called head cover in Arabic, that's a khimar, not hijab. Hijab means veil or hijab means any barrier or something like that. That's where the head covering veil is khimar, okay? It's in the Quran as khimar. Hence people say hijab in the Quran. Hijab is mentioned in terms of having a barrier between people, but khimar is mentioned as having the head covering. People don't know that. Um, and then you got the kameez for the lady as well. That's how it works, okay? So there'll be um, extra two pieces which will be marked there in red, okay? All right. So there's the, again, three strings. You've got the izar, you've got the khimar. This is the order that some say you could put the khimar on the very outside, okay? Some say swap these around. Others say put the kafan, uh, the lifafa, the big one outside, then put this one just inside that. You will find often they put this one, the, this, this khirqa, uh, outside. So they put this down first, and then the lifafa, but in this diagram it's been put down here. Um, and you've got the izar, which is on top of these two, and then you've got the head covering, which is on top of that, and then you've got the kamis. They're not going to get in the way of each other, the kamis and the head covering, really. So, but yeah, the kamis would be what you're going first, then the head covering you'd put on, then the izar would go over, then the khirqa, uh, the chest covering would go over the izar. And on the outside, one big lifafa would occur for the lady. Like I said, some put the khirqa chest covering on the very outer, not a problem. And then you bring in the deceased lady and place her in the coffin as such. And again, fold things up with left first, then the right on top. Left first, then the right on top. Uh, in reverse order to put them down. Right. So starting with the uh, hijab, that would be, that's on her head, then moving to the izar. Then moving to the khimar, and then the last one to be folded is the is the lifafa. If you're not following, you should because it's the reverse order. I said earlier, have a little think about it. Um, and th those who do ghusl, those who do the shrouding of deceased, you know, our elders and community learners in the community, they know all this, right? And they'll be, you know, uh, helping. But I want to make a point about this. Just because you don't know doesn't mean you don't get involved if it's your relative, right? You don't just say, oh, there's a lot of people, Imam Saab or whatever, you know, ladies that are composed. So they are, mashallah, they're great people. They, they, they help out the, whenever somebody passes away. But if it's your family member, then you actually have the greatest rights and responsibility, therefore, like you said, it comes with rights and responsibilities. Responsibilities come with rights, right? To be the one that does this. And personally, um, and I'm sure most people are like this, um, I would want a family member to do it. A pious member, if there's a pious sheikh around, yeah, bring him. <laughs> I'd love for him to do my uh, ghusl and you know, takfeen. But really, I'd want my children, my 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 son, my my brother, whoever is around, if I pass away, to be the one that really took lead in charge because you know he, that's who he is to me, right? Um, and we need to do that for our family members when they leave this world. We can't just brush it off to someone else. Um, so you know, this is why we should learn. And then take part. And they'll still others will still be there to support. It's not like one person does this. There's, there could be five people in the room sitting. Unnecessary people is not good. But there could be eight people in the room, six, five, four, you know. Uh, the ghost of that being a part of usually between four to eight people are there, right? It's, it's, and that's really what all is needed. And you know, this whole procedure is done. A whistle before like the last time, and then the coffin in this occasion. Okay, so the further more rulings about the ladies is our uh, coffin. Uh, the sufficient shrouding for a woman are three, uh, the inner wrapper, the outer wrapper, and the veil. 
Yeah, so if we can't get everything for a lady, what should we try to make? Again, you can do as best as possible, but you should definitely get the outer and the inner, the lifata and the izar, and that was all for men. But for the ladies, you should try and also get the khima, the head covering as well. But like I said, whatever's available, just try, you do your best with what's available. Fondo. Her hair is then divided into two folds and placed over the right and left breast over the shirt. Yeah, so braid the hair of the deceased lady, right? And uh, you place them over the chest, that's right, right? Usually, Shah will have the firatain and they place in the chest above the qamis, right? So, when she's placed into the qamis, the hair will be coming down onto her chest in braids, okay? Remember, only ladies are going to see this, men don't get to see this. And then the hijab, or sorry, the khimar, excuse me, will be used to cover the hair. So, his hair won't be seen once she's cut. I mean, it's all gone by the time the khirka and the izar, come, uh, khirka, izar and lifasa come on, everything is covered by then. But even the khimar itself, the veil will cover the hair of the deceased. So the lady. The veil is then placed upon the head and the face over the shirt so that it will end up being uh, under the outer wrapper. Yeah. Okay. So you, you use the, uh, the kamis is already on, right? Then you will do what? The khimar, the veil, right? You go over the head, so the face is getting therefore covered. And some of the chest will therefore be covered. You could have put it a bit down, further down, just between the up from the neck up from the diagram. Diagram is it to scale 100%. It's just an idea of what happens. Yeah, so it will be above the kamis. That's the kamis is first. And then the khimar will be second, like you said. What's the next one that's going to be put over the khimar and the kamis, remainder of the kamis? The izar. Okay, so in terms of folding up, this is number one, the kamis. It's not folding up, it's just there. It's already on. You put them into the kamis, it's on. This is number two, the, the khimar. Okay. Khimar is then folded, and like I said, you could go a bit further down and cover it like that, right? Uh, number three is the this green one, the izar. Okay, this is the next one to be folded over the deceased lady. Tfaddal, carry on. Uh, the breast cloth is then tied over. Yeah, the breast cloth is the khirqa, which is the chest cover. This one, it, like I said, it's mentioned in the book like this. Some pretty on the outside, the very outside, but it's mentioned in the book like this as well. Then the, this one, meaning the khirqa, is the fourth one to be folded and put onto the deceased, right? So left over there uh, and fold it in and then right on top. That covers the, the bosom chest area. And then finally? Uh, the shrouds, be they for a man or woman, are then scented with aroma from aloes. Um, and this is performed in odd numbers before the deceased is placed in them. Yeah, so I didn't really mention the last point, which is obvious. Then the... Uh, Lifafa would go, the blue one, the outer one, that's number five then, right? Lifafa would be last to be folded over. And then again, you could tie up everything with these um, uh, cloth strings there. And that's the lady's coffin performed fully. It doesn't take long, by the way. Gusel takes a bit long and so forth. Coffin is pretty straightforward. Once you get the deceased in, literally, into the, that's probably the hardest part. After that, just folding cloth takes literally a few minutes. Uh, it's not a rushed or anything. Like putting your clothes on, it doesn't take long to put clothes on, right? It's the same thing we're putting the clothes of the deceased on, it's the coffin. So it won't take long, five, ten minutes. Uh, you obviously want to make it sure it's all secure and everything. Um, it's, a, it's a much quicker process than the ghusl, of course. Um, and once that's done, they're ready for the Salat al janaza. Okay, but you just mentioned now some rulings regarding the actual coffin. So first of all, the coffin should be perfumed as well. And it says here that the bukhur or the uh, the the... the the uh, uh jammer, which means which means to be placed in the like the fragrant smoke you know this in, in, incense they burn and stuff and generally you should you know should have a good smell to it so you can apply perfume to etc for both men and women okay this so is generally for everyone um it's in, that's part of the sunnah that's part of etiquettes of the the coffin right so you know please do that for your beloved uh, family members that leave this world etc so the uh, the, sh the shroud of necessity, whether for a man or a woman, is what is available, as mentioned in the hadith earlier. Yeah, so again, whatever is available, really, for men, it's drop one, which is drop the qamis, just do the two outer ones. For women, you drop the qamis and the, the, the khirqa, and just do the head and the lifafa and the outer. So do the two big ones and one for the lady, that's dropping two for her. Uh, but that's only, what well, if you only got the one cloth to drop the whole body? Yeah, that's it. You can have one leaf. If you can get one leaf alpha, which is the biggest one, that wraps everything up. That's all you've got. That's that's basically the bare, bare minimum for a coffin, is to cover the whole body with one piece of cloth. Now, that's not ideal, 
the sunnah was not admitted, so we try and do the sunnah. And inshallah, it shouldn't be a problem doing that. But if a situation ever arose where that would occur, then you know, whatever is possible, inshallah. Um, and then that concludes. So, like I said, the individual now is ready for being taken for the janazah. So you have to have the body present with the ghusl, and then obviously kafan is performed. Now the next stage for this person will be the janazah prayer. So whatever that occurs, normally in the masajid now, but usually it was out in the open area where people would gather, the deceased would be there, an imam would lead the prayer, they would pray the prayer, and they would take this body towards the graveyard anyway, around there they would have a separate section for prayer area, musalla, uh, and then from there they would literally just go to the uh, grave, would be dug up already, and they'd bury the deceased. So inshallah, next time, we will be talking about the janazah prayer and how uh, who, who performs it, how it's performed. Is it allowed to be repeated? People often ask that question, especially when you know bodies are transported and things happen, and especially with the situation we're in right now, um, in the lockdown of COVID in 2020. Um, so we'll come on to that topic of the janazah prayer next time. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ma'in.